Hey, Big Rye, sun's getting real low. It's Rygar on NES Works. Well, that didn't take long. Tecmo only just made their dual release debut two episodes ago, and here we are with another. And this game feels a lot bigger and more up to the moment than Mighty Bomb Jack or Solomon's Key did. Like those games, Drygar had debuted in arcades before coming to consoles. The difference was that there was a year or so between the US and Japanese releases of Tecmo's first two titles, whereas Rygar hit the states just a couple of months after it had shipped in Japan. You can really see the difference in how developers had begun to approach games here the evolution of Famicom design. Like Mighty Bomb Jack, Rygar on NES is less a console adaptation of the coin-op game than it is an expanded sequel, but it's much more impressive than Bomb Jack. In fact, this game, coming from a young, untested studio, is every bit as ambitious in its way as Castlevania or Kid Icarus. It's less polished and considerably more haphazard, but this is a bigger, more substantial work than any other contemporary version of Rygar. In arcades, Rygar belonged to a small but undeniable trend of barbarian character action games alongside the likes of Taito's Rastan Saga and, arguably, Castlevania. Big muscular guys roamed through a fantasy hellscape fighting endless arrays of strange monsters like the dayglow children of Arnold Schwarzenegger's turn as Conan the Barbarian. Honestly, Castlevania will probably be coming up a lot in this episode because Rygar really does feel of a pair with Konami's adventure. The protagonist here, the warrior of Argul, who may or may not also be the eponymous Rygar, it's a bit of an ambiguous localization, differs from sword-swinging heroes like Rastin or Capcom's Trojan by wielding a weapon with a bit more range. In this case, the warrior swings something called a disc armor, which is basically Captain America's shield on an elastic chain. The disc armor has slightly lower range than Simon Belmont's vampire killer whip, but like that weapon, it can be boosted in strength and extended with the application of the correct power-ups. The disc armor is one of the striking visual elements that help define Rygar, along with the iconic sunset background image of the first stage. Otherwise though, this adventure doesn't have that much to do with the original arcade rendition of Rygar, which was pretty mundane. That game spanned 27 agonizingly long levels. Once you cleared the first three stages, you'd seen pretty much all the game had to offer, but you were only a ninth of the way through the quest. This was a lengthy, tedious slog full of cheap hits designed to gobble up quarters for those who dreamed of claiming local arcade bragging rights by suffering the game's endurance test long enough to defeat the final boss. Tecmo released or licensed the game out to a fair few platforms, and all of them but the NES game closely resembled the arcade title, a long, linear, repetitive action game. Around this time, Nintendo is said to have implemented a policy with its third-party licensees that required them to make the NES or Famicom releases of multi-platform titles unique in some meaningful way. I'm unsure of the full truth of this claim, but it certainly does scan with what we've begun to see here on NES Works. Arcade to NES ports will rarely resemble the coin-op original from this point on, and it's not just a matter of the console lacking the power to pull it off when platforms like the Atari 7800, ZX Spectrum, and Master System would continue seeing faithful adaptations well into the 90s. The tendency of, or requirement for NES to developers to put some kind of unique spin on their arcade ports has always been a matter of debate for gaming enthusiasts. Some hate the changes and resent the NES's surprising lack of note-for-note -note arcade conversions, while others see it as a strength of the console. I personally tend to fall into the latter category, especially in this day and age, when publishers like Hamster and Capcom have been very diligent about republishing their coin-op classics on modern consoles. Rygar is a case-in-point example of this, in fact. Hamster has published the original Rygar in its Arcade Archives line for PlayStation 4, and Tecmo put the coin-op game in its Virtual Console Arcade line before that. And frankly, that version kind of sucks. Again, it's a boring, repetitive slog. Meanwhile, the NES game has its flaws, but it holds up a lot better nowadays than the source material it was based on. If Tecmo had stayed in its lane with Rygar, all we'd have today would be another visually unimpressive port of a tedious arcade game. Instead, we have Rygar. At first glance, Rygar on NES looks pretty much identical to the arcade game. The Warrior of Argul looks pretty much the same, accounting for hardware differences, and the first stage is a straightforward exercise in running left to right while slashing bad guys and hopping over pits in front of a vivid red sunset. It's only once you reach the next area, which isn't actually a new stage, just a separate section of the mountains, that you start to notice things are amiss. 
You need to climb ropes and ascend to a different layer of screens in order to pass one particularly wide pit. And once you reach the top of that first rope, you come across a door. Inside the door you find not a new stage, but rather a room where a giant man tells you about the entrance to something called Garlaws. Exit and descend down the other side of the chasm. You can keep running to the right, arcade style, until you reach the end of the level. But the door that awaits you on the lower segment of ground here doesn't take you to another stage. Instead, it reveals another room with a hermit talking about Garlaws. You have to double back and explore this area, climbing and descending rope ladders around a minor maze of cliffs and bluffs, until you come across the door that does take you to the next stage, which it turns out is the aforementioned Garlaws. Here, Rygar becomes a completely different game altogether. Up until this point, it's been a slightly expanded rendition of the coin-op adventure, but Garlaws completely changes up the style of the adventure from side-scroller to top-down platformer. This is something we haven't seen before in NES works. Eh, Ninja Kid did a little of this with its map screen, but Garlaz isn't just a map. It's a proper action hub that allows the warrior of Argul to explore and connect to other regions, defeat bosses, and acquire new tools. Then return and revisit old areas, now with the abilities and tools to properly navigate them. Folks, this is it. The first NES Metroidvania. And we're still a month out from Metroid. Yes, on NES, Rygar became a proper action RPG. Defeating enemies, earns our hero experience points, which enhance his tone, or strength, and last, or physical endurance. The warrior can make use of a trio of magic spells to restore his health or enhance his power. He acquires better weapons and tools that help him traverse the world. A mindless arcade melee platformer has transformed into a tough, tidy, compact take on the role-playing game. And while it has its shortcomings, it's pretty great. The world of Rygar consists of about a dozen side-scrolling areas connected through Garlaws. There are a handful of top-down areas similar to Garlaws, and these contain the game's main bosses. Defeated enemies drop icons that boost the warrior's mind meter, or magic points basically, while also boosting his cumulative experience level. This was all very cryptic and mysterious to young NES-owning kids in 1987, because very little on the system had given us context for understanding the concepts of role-playing games. With the hindsight of a few decades, however, we can appreciate that what we have here is a breakthrough title on par with Kid Icarus. Action games evolved radically from score attacks to meaty adventures during the NES era, and Rygar here leads the charge. In the wider context, this adventure belongs to the RPG bandwagon I referred to last episode. We didn't experience Dragon Quest and its descendants in the US on the same schedule as Japan, which means proper RPGs didn't arrive here until after the RPG-inflected action games that they inspired. On Famicom, Rygar slotted neatly into the likes of Wings of Medulla, The Mystery of Atlantis, Deadly Towers, or Challenger. Heck, Challenger even featured a similar multi-format perspective, shifting between side-scroller and top-down viewpoints from level to level. American kids were pretty lucky that Rygar, along with Kid Icarus, introduced them to this new school of game design. It's a much, much better game than any of the others I just mentioned, an impressive piece of work from Tecmo. The combat mechanics can admittedly be a little flighty at times, the Discarmer has a tendency to drag enemies into the warrior for untelegraphed damage, and bosses mostly boil down to activating the attack and assail spell and spamming the action button. But the controls feel responsive, and collision detection is clean. Rygar isn't an easy game, especially as it has to be completed in a single sitting, but it feels wholly fair, and it's full of interesting scenery and characters. Rygar's world spans rugged mountainscapes, swamps, caverns, floating islands, and rocky lakes. The lonely mountain men you meet appear in two forms, hermits who drop cryptic and not always useful hints, and mystic Endora monks who give the warrior useful tools to advance in his quest. You can tell the difference pretty easily because the Endora have a third eye, and also they give you cool gear. Enemies appear constantly throughout the adventure, but you don't really come across cheap or unfair attack patterns. You almost always have time and clearance to take out foes as they appear. The toughest bad guys tend to be the ones you have to fight in the top-down areas, since the perspective makes it difficult to perfectly judge distances and spatial relationships. Likewise, it's annoyingly easy to walk off the edge of a platform in Garlaz until you get a feel for the way the warrior interacts with top-down environments. This becomes especially annoying once you acquire the grappling wire and skyhook and have to latch onto posts and cables in order to traverse gaps so you can advance. As with Kid Icarus's issues though, these feel like modest complaints in the face of what Rygar's designers were trying to accomplish. Taken in the context of its time, Rygar is pretty gutsy, 
and if it tends to be a bit sloppy or grindy in places, well, developers were still learning. As I mentioned before, Rygar lacks any sort of save or password feature. It's another one of those games you have to complete in a single sitting, but thankfully it's pretty forgiving when it comes to punishing deaths. You lose your current power-ups and a bit of experience when the warrior falls, but you lose very little progress. The levels here are far more brief than those in Kid Icarus, so continuing rarely feels like a huge setback. Plus, all the key items you acquire become a permanent part of your inventory, so that once you gain the ability to grapple upward to reach high platforms, you'll always have that power. Compared to Castlevania, the Warrior of Arguil's combat capabilities are pretty meager. Outside of casting some limited and expensive magic spells, you pretty much just hit things with the disc armor. The Warrior does have the odd ability to jump on most foes without taking damage. Hopping on a bad guy will usually stun it momentarily, while sending the hero bouncing on past. So it's a strange, sometimes enigmatic game. The adventure's alien sensibility is only furthered by the motley nature of the enemies you fight, which range from armadillos to laser robots to multi-headed snails. And the same holds true for the terse hints you receive from hermits. But honestly, all of this just makes it better. Rygar is the best kind of arcade to NES port, one that eschews the literal nature of the original game and instead tries to exceed it on its own terms. No, there aren't 27 individual stages here, but the environments you traverse are much more interesting. They're complex, and they interconnect in meaningful ways that reward players who have developed a sense of spatial awareness in virtual places. Posts and thin platforms you pass early in the quest become the keys to reaching advanced areas once you've procured the necessary tools. Is Rygar as good at being an exploratory action RPG as, say, The Legend of Zelda or Metroid? No, not really, but it beat them here. Along with Kid Icarus, Rygar was part of a new breed of NES games that hinted at the potential of shallow action games to draw players into vast and immersive worlds. It's a true NES great, and it's a shame that it's largely been pushed aside in the collective memory of gamers by the even more impressive classics it helped pave the way for. It's the John the Baptist to Fazanadu's Jesus. Next on NES Works, even more blasphemy as Capcom joins the arcade adulterating fund. 